Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, an Arizona education special. We'll look at concerns regarding Hispanic education issues, and we'll learn about an educational program that involves students recycling computers. Those stories next on this special edition of Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the special Arizona Education Edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. We start with a look at education problems faced by the growing Hispanic population. There are more Latino students in Arizona schools than non-Hispanic Caucasians, but Latino students score over 20 points lower on Ames tests than non-Hispanic whites. We'll hear from two panelists about how best to improve that situation, but first we meet a young woman with big dreams. I'm working on writing essays and filling out applications, getting letters from my mentor. Karina Iribe Romo's scholarship search is pretty specific. I'm working on two different ones right now. She's looking for private groups willing to support students known as DREAMers, and those like her often called DACAs, which stands for Deferred Action Childhood Arrivals. Deferred Action is basically a permit that allows undocumented people that qualify, that meet the qualifications, to get a permit to be in the United States for two years at a time and it allows you to work and be here without the fear of deportation. At the age of seven, Karina left Mexico with her mom and sister and moved to Arizona. It would take 10 years before she began to understand the limits associated with certain labels. Right after I graduated, I went to Estrella College and they were like, the counselor was very excited. She's like, oh, you qualify for a presidential scholarship. You can go to school for free here. And then I looked at her and I was like, oh, I can't, I don't qualify for that. And she's like, why not? And then she looked over my, my paper again and she's like, oh, I see, you know, you're, you don't have a social. Without a social security number, Karina was considered undocumented. That meant she could get no public scholarships based on merit and she had to pay higher out-of-state tuition rates. I started taking two classes at a time because that's what would still keep me within a reasonable price. So I started doing that and I would go to two, two classes at a time. I went through a phase where I, I gave up and I said, you know, this is gonna take me forever just to get an associate's and I stopped going to school. But then I went back um, only to find another tuition hike. In 2012, thanks to President Barack Obama's executive order, Karina was granted deferred action status. That opened the door for in-state tuition rates at the Maricopa County Community College District. Right when I got my permit, right when I got my deferred action in the May, I went to the Astoria College and enrolled full time and I was finally able to graduate after six years. And I am the oldest of six at home. So that's a really big, you know, big example that I'm studying for my, my brothers and sisters. So I tried to instill that in them, you know, if I could do it and it took me this long. You, you know, you guys are all American citizens. You have every opportunity to be able to go to school, get scholarships or get a job and pay for it. Even if you have to take out a loan, that you have that opportunity and you maximize it. While receiving deferred action has helped, the DACA label only goes so far. Karina wants to earn a bachelor's degree, but unlike community colleges, Arizona's public universities won't offer her in-state tuition rates. So the scholarship search continues. For a closer look at the challenges and possible solutions facing Hispanic education in Arizona, we spoke with Dr. Kent Scribner, superintendent of the Phoenix Union High School District and a member of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanics, and Dr. Dahlia Sines, an associate professor of psychology and vice provost for undergraduate education at ASU. Good to have you both here. Thank Hello. you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you. We've got 17,000 more Latino students in Arizona schools than white students. We've got uh, uh, 20 points, though, lower on the Ames tests. What's going on out there? Well, I think um, one of the biggest issues is uh, the historic approach to focusing on low-income and language and minority students. Uh, Latino students are the largest, youngest, and fastest growing minority population. And urban schools and low-income schools have historically focused on minimizing their failure, focusing on what I would call a deficit model, and not focusing on maximizing their success and investing in our students as the assets that they truly are. Is that deficit model a bad thing considering all else, all other factors involved? I don't think the deficit model is 
absolutely wrong, but, ever, but it does fail to take into account the complexities that are involved in creating success. And as Dr. Uh, Scribner said, we really need to build on strengths of students and create educational systems where their strengths are highlighted, where teachers have cultural competence, where parents are actually invited to get involved in the school, and where all students are given an opportunity. Give us an example of building on strengths. Sure. We have uh, in our school systems, um, magnet schools, for example, that, that focus on science or biology, uh, where students are presented with opportunities rather than treated as if there's a deficit. And when given that type of encouragement, we've seen example after example where they succeed, where they go on to the next level and really are competitive in the educational system. Is that a different model than what has historically been used in public schools? And if it's a different model, why does it need to be different? It absolutely needs to be different. We don't want to be like these other large city systems, LA, Chicago, Philadelphia, Miami, dealing with Latino students in particular as problems that need to be fixed. We need to look at our students as assets that need to be invested in. What we've historically done is focused on metrics like suspension rate and absenteeism and dropout rate, all very important things that we must attend to. But if we only do that, you do that at the expense of middle achieving and upper achieving students who do happen to live in the urban core do happen to be low income, Latino, or language minority. The, the, the concept of cultural differences, uh, it, how much does that factor in? The fact that a lot of parents out there of these students, uh, they don't have advanced degrees. Some of them didn't finish school. Some of them are, 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 are looking at their children. They can't help them too much with homework. How does that factor in? Well, this is true. Many of the parents aren't highly educated um, and they can't help with homework. However, if you look at study after study, including some of the research that I've done, it suggests that the number one priority for Latino parents is the education of their children. So they're interested in having their kids succeed. They want to provide that opportunity and they're willing to help the school system as well. The other thing is that we really can't think about our children as minority anymore because if you look at the demographics of our state, Hispanics are the largest group already and if you combine all minority groups together, they actually create the majority of students in our school population. And so it's not so much uh, bending the norms to make it culturally responsive, it's simply creating a situation that serves the students who are in our pipeline now. Does that mean more of an embrace of diversity out there? And that's, that's kind of a, a buzzword, buzz phrase. There. How do you embrace diversity in the school system? Well, uh, I don't think it's a function of multi a need for multicultural focus. I, need, I think it's a focus on rigor, um, access to, to honors courses, <laughs> advanced placement. Our kids are smart. And if we invest in them, if we push them, if we provide rigor, relevance in instruction, meaningful relations with between adults and students, we will find it's the right thing to do. This is not some social justice rallying cry to help Latinos. This is arithmetic. There's 60% of the incoming uh, kindergartners. What kind of Arizona do we want to live in in the next 10, 20, 30 years? Arizona success is Latino education success. Uh, interesting that you mentioned raising expectations because that challenge, it would seem to me, would make a lot of sense. I mean, you, put, you, you say, so go do this. Let's see if you can do that. The kid, most kids say, I'm, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm right. going to give it a try. Is it viable, though, again, in such a massive public school setting? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have small specialized programs, bioscience, high school, one of our top performing um, uh, blue uh, uh, gold medal um, from, the, from the Department of Education, um, uh, Franklin Police and Fire High School. We're talking about a coding academy, small specialized, highly rigorous programs. Uh, this is the future workforce. If we do not invest in this future workforce, it's not only go good for our students, it's good for business, it's good for Arizona. It's that magic word, invest. Exactly. Uh, talk to us about that. And it's not just investment in students and programs, but it's also investment in teacher development. So having them become certified, um, either in terms of bilingual or in terms of uh, special bioscience technology, having them, giving them the tools that they need in order to be available for students. That's essential. You know, in 2012, the Morris Institute published a report which suggested that Arizona was at risk of becoming a second tier state educationally and econ economically. And I think we risk that if we don't pay attention to some of the disparities that we've seen in our education system based on ethnicity and race. Okay, so we've got some good ideas out there. Things are happening. The Carl Hayden Robotics Team right. has made mm -hmm. international headlines exactly. here. So things are happening and yet there is still that achievement gap. Are we expecting that gap to close too quickly? Why aren't we getting better quicker? That's, a, that's the 
$64,000 question. And I think there has to be a mindset change. We have seen programs across the country where teachers are trained to think about a growth mindset rather than a static mindset. And it turns out when you train teachers to think about intelligence is something that's incremental and that can grow, it benefits everybody, not just minority kids. So I think systemic change is needed here. Is systemic change going to take a while? Do we have to be patient? We, we don't have time to wait. We must invest today. And we have magnificent, incredible, intelligent students. We have a student uh, from Alhambra High School, Josh Elisete, rode the bus to Burton Bar uh, Library, built websites and blogs, made more money than the average Arizona while he was in high school, graduated ASU, Barrett Honors, in two and a half years, fastest ever, now runs a multi-million dollar digital marketing company. A kid, 22 years old, has employees all over the world. A Phoenix Union Alhambra High School kid, they are in our schools. We must invest in them if we want to have a viable economy moving forward. Okay, how do we invest in them? What needs to be invested? <clears throat> Exposure to rigorous curriculum, dual enrollment opportunities. Mm -hmm. Our kids come to school, 83% of them live in poverty. So the opportunity to earn some college credit in their junior and senior year is crucial doubling the numbers of AP uh, offerings, advanced placement, honors. We've done all these things. Now we have to continue to do it, reach down to our elementaries and focus on, on rigor from, from pre-K through the university. Likewise, providing support so that students can afford <coughs> to take the SAT and the ACT, and this will allow them to be competitive for college. Mm -hmm. That's very important. It's, it's a low-cost investment, but it can reap tremendous benefit. So as, as we wrap it up here, the best way to address this education gap you think is... I think it's redoing the whole system, being responsive to the students that, rather than continuing the same old pattern. So providing greater opportunity, raising expectations, and providing the students with the strength that they need to continue. Is that happening in certain areas, but not enough areas? Is that tide slowly washing over the state? What's happening out there? I think it is happening in certain areas, and I think Phoenix Union is a perfect example of some of the programs they have there. But we'd like to see more of that, and we'd like to see greater coordination between the high school level and the earlier levels. That, that coordination's big, isn't it? Absolutely. We must transform the culture, move away from minimizing young people's failure and move toward maximizing their success. You optimistic? I'm, I am optimistic. We have no other choice. <laughs> our, students, our students are the adults of the future. Latino, educator, Latino students today are our workforce moving forward. We don't have any other choice, but you can be a little less than optimistic and when you see the numbers and you see the results. Are you optimistic? I'm very optimistic. And I think once the whole state thinks of Arizona as the reality that it truly is, then they will invest, irrespective of whether the child is Latino, Native American, Black, Asian, or white. All right, That's very where good. we need to head. Good to have you both here. Thanks Thank for you. joining Thanks. us. Thanks. Expand your horizon with the Arizona Horizon website. To get there, go to azpbs.org, click on the Arizona Horizon tab at the top of the screen. Once there, you can access many features to help you make a more informed viewer. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button, or scroll down to the bottom of the page for the most recent segments. You can also find out what's on Arizona Horizon for the coming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or want to buy a video, that's all on the website too. Want to learn about specific topics like immigration or the legislature? You can visit our special web sections. There's also a page for educators. Show your support for Arizona Horizon at azpbs.org slash Arizona Horizon. We wrap up our Arizona Education Special with a look at a program called STRUT, which stands for Students Recycling Used Technology. It's an effort to educate high school students on a variety of levels through the refurbishing of computers. We'll hear from the executive director of STRUT in a moment, but first, producer Christina Estes shows us how the program works at Tempe High School. It's not surprising that the principal's office is pretty far away from Mr. Taysom's computer manufacturing class. Music, yeah, <laughs> it's always really loud. As 32 students learn the latest technology lingo, I'll just put in the 512s. They also pick up some old school lyrics, courtesy of Mr. Taysom's favorites. He wants uh, people to like, to be happy in this class. He doesn't want anybody to um, fail. He wants everybody to succeed. And I think the music kind of gets people going on into doing uh, better. For three years, Mauricio Sanchez has taken the class. These are both gigs. As a senior, he now leads a team of four younger students. Get a blue video cable. Including freshman Enrique Carrasco, 
I always loved games, you know, I'd play on, you know, a PlayStation or a computer or, you know, just to play, but I didn't actually think the components inside of a computer would be, you know, something I'd be doing later in high school. Ah, uh, come on now. In the beginning of the year, we got a computer and we had to take it apart, everything, to where it was empty and put it all back together. I was surprised because, I mean, I've never really done anything, that's, you know, so complicated, but yet it's actually, to me now, it's easy. Tempe is among 15 Arizona schools where teachers train 500 Strut students. Okay, here's your problem right here. Mr. Taysom requires each student refurbish at least 18 computers per semester. This stack is waiting to be fixed, and this one is heading to another school. I'm actually really happy and proud that uh, we're able to help other um, students and other schools with our program. Keep trying it until you get it fixed and figured out. According to Arizona Strut, nearly 200 schools and charities received more than 3,000 computers last year thanks to these students. It's just a mind blow because I, I didn't even think of taking a class like this and now I actually want to take it next year and the year after that. For more on Strut, we spoke with the executive director of the program, Tom Maylert. Good to have you here. This this sounds very interesting. Give me a better definition. A Strut Techie Camp. What are we talking about here? So Arizona Students Recycling use technology. We take all computers from all computer electronics from anybody here in the state. We use students to do the refurbishing. And once the computers are refurbished, we donate them out to other schools and nonprofits all here in the state. And e-waste is recycled as well. What is e-waste? So e-waste is the electronics that we do not refurbish and that we recycle responsibly. Okay. What did they, because this is a, this, these segments are focused on education in general. Right. So in general, what are kids learning out of all this? So the, the key on the segment that just, just aired is, we have 700 students, over 700 students in 19 what I'll call strut schools. These are our partner schools that are helping us refurbish the computers. These are high schools, uh, a couple of community colleges, and we have a very few select junior high programs that are helping us work on some computers. Uh, the, the age keeps getting younger all the time that get involved with this. And so they are learning to uh, repair, refurbish computer technology. Uh, a lot of times then it goes into computer networking. So that's, that's the core. It, it, but it sounds like a STEM skills are learned oh, out of all this? Oh, very much. We're always working on STEM, STEM science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics. And we also then do the techie camps. I didn't allude to that earlier. And this is geared to a lot of middle school kids. We often do this in the summer with the YMCAs or the Boys and Girls Clubs, where we will take in a computer and we, we work at ask at risk students so if they were at risk if they qualify for the uh, free or reduced school lunch program then if they don't have a computer at home we get them bring them into a camp they tear one apart they put it back together and then they take it home with them yeah and so it's not just here's a gift and they're waiting to call tech support a little later when it goes down they take it home they've been elbows deep into it and they are going to work on it themselves get it going in a lot of cases uh, one of the individuals that was interviewed earlier didn't realize that they could do that. And what we want to do is get it in their hands so that it's something that, oh, if it clicks and they're going, oh, I can do this. Oh, this is eventually going to lead to me maybe working on an iPhone or an iPad or a tablet at some point because that is where it's leading to. Uh, it's the, it's the, the start of those tech skills and education that maybe they didn't think was going to be a good fit for them before. I would imagine workplace skills, teamwork, that sort of thing, that also plays a part. That's also yes. part of the educational process. Yes. We support, uh, we support that in all the schools. We don't dictate the curriculum, whether it's high school or community college. And there is a lot of teamwork in that. We also take student interns at our own locations, and we have interns, volunteers, and it becomes a good um, uh, group bonding kind of experience. The, also, the other thing is when we donate the equipment out uh, to schools or if it's a, a nonprofit, if the nonprofit comes in and picks up the computers, a lot of times that class and gets to know what local organization that's doing well, did they just help? Did yes. they just support? And that's uh, when I became executive director, I undermined, I didn't, I didn't 
I undervalued that immensely, and it's, it's really good for our, our students to see that. So again, in terms of the education process here, uh, this program, I would imagine accountability is also learned, mm -hmm. communication is also learned. It seems like it's more than just learning science-y, tech-y kind of skills. Right, we kind of trick them into it. <laughs> The other thing is it's very experiential. So there's some students that may not be the A students. This is an ex outstanding program for them because they get hands-on and they're, they're doing this and doing this. And then later on, the vocabulary just becomes kind of second nature as opposed to having to, um, uh, to, to pull it out of a, a textbook or something. It, the, um, you know, the experiential aspect really brings it out. Uh, do, you, do you see that? I mean, because again, everyone's looking for the best way to communicate, to connect with kids, to teach them. And sometimes through something like this, they may get lessons that a whole lot of classroom hours just can't accomplish. Right, there's a lot of teamwork. And, and especially with the, within our camps, we often team them up together at the beginning when we're tearing the computer apart. It's a little less daunting. In other words, they're kind of teaming up. They don't feel like, oh, if they messed up, you know, it's like, oh, I messed up. The other thing is with all of our equipment, it's donated, and if it, if it damages, it's not, there's not this big investment in it. So it, it lessens that, um, anyway, it makes it a more casual right. uh, educational environment. So what kind of reaction have you had from the kids? What kind of reaction have you had from parents? Oh, both very good. I mean, there's a lot of kids that get involved, and, and it, it's like, um, one of the individuals said before, they, they didn't think they would like it. Now all of a sudden it's like, oh, I can do this. And, uh, and the parents love it. There's a lot of times where uh, this clicks and it gets, some cases we have interns that come and they're now doing production work rather than sitting at home watching a game and being a technology user. We're trying to push more being a technology producer. Yes. And you know that's where uh, I, we see the, the greater benefit. Okay, so if people were watching this and they, this sounds like a pretty neat program, I got a computer, I don't need this thing anymore. Uh, can they donate? Do they donate? How do they donate? <laughs> so the, the big thing is go to azstrut.org, uh, click on uh, donations because we've got a number of locations. Some of our high schools will take the donations. We have two of our main locations, one in the East Valley that's open Tuesdays and Thursdays, one at Metro Center Mall on Wednesdays, nine to three. And, uh, we can do pickups if the, the quantity is larger. We have a great need for what we're donating out, so we love corporations to help us out with donations of equipment as well. All right, very good. Well, there are a variety of ways to educate kids, and it sounds like Strut is taking a unique approach, and it sounds like it's working. Congratulations on your success. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us on this Arizona Education Edition of Arizona Horizon. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Helios Education Foundation is proud to underwrite Arizona Education, a 12-month series highlighting the issues affecting college and career readiness of our students. Through a decade of strategic partnerships, Helios is working to change lives and strengthen communities through education.